Chapter 7 The Conveyor Belt The Dilemma of Alienation When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. Carter G. Woodson, The Miseducation of the Negro My first major sports story for the New York Times appeared in April 1983. The subject was the annual McDonald's All-America Basketball Game, featuring the best high school basketball players in the country. I arrived in Atlanta two days before the game and decided to attend one of the practice sessions. I walked over to the arena with Bob Minix, at the time an NCAA investigator, whose job was to make sure that no improper contact took place between coaches and players. There was almost a revival atmosphere inside the Omni that afternoon. A congregation of 65 coaches scattered throughout the arena, legs crossed, arms folded, watched as player after player executed this maneuver or that. This was part beauty pageant, part meat market, and the players were willing participants. I'd never seen the recruiting meat market up close, and had certainly never seen anything like this. I wasn't highly recruited as a high school football player, and none of my teammates were either. It was a different time, with a different level of pressure. The only scandal I'd been aware of back in those days involved Bernard Stevens, an all-city, all-state fullback from Chicago Vocational School. Stevens had been very highly recruited and finally chose the University of Illinois. Soon after he made his choice, news reports uncovered a so-called slush fund at the university used to pay athletes, including Stevens. I remember how the imagery conjured up by the word slush sullied Stevens' reputation. I wonder why a big white school like Illinois felt it had to buy a young black athlete, precisely the sort of teenager the university would otherwise ignore. By the time I arrived at Atlanta for that McDonald's All-Star game in 1983, I understood why. Money. A top recruit could mean the difference between a winning season and a losing season, a big bowl game or a short season and all the revenue and priceless prestige that came from a successful program. Each athlete had his own flock of coaches surrounding him. Tom Sheehy, a six foot eight inch center from McQuaid Jesuit High School in Rochester, had Larry Farmer of UCLA, Gary Williams of Boston College, and Terry Holland of Virginia. Holland was also following Kenny Smith, the six-foot, one-inch guard from Archbishop Malloy in Queens, New York. But most of the interest was reserved for Reggie Williams, the smooth six-foot-seven forward from Dunbar High School in Baltimore and one of the most highly recruited seniors of the 1983 class of All-Americans. Farmer, John Thompson of Georgetown, and Bobby Cremins of Georgia Tech were the finalists for Williams' talents. My, my, my! Thompson said admiringly as he watched Williams maneuver on court and smoothly knock down a medium-range jumper. I asked Thompson what he thought about the All-American games. To be honest, he said, I don't see a lot of good in these games. By now, you've seen all the players, but you're almost compelled to attend these games if you're interested in a kid. Most coaches I know would prefer not to have these games. But if five or six coaches are interested in the same kid you're interested in, you have to come or risk having the kid think you're not interested. Isn't that something, I thought. Accomplished, mature, mostly white adults representing the most prestigious education institutions in the country don't want young, mostly black men with basketball skills to think they're not interested. So they show up and sit and woo and coo. This was a snapshot of how the American dilemma of race finds its way into the realm of contemporary sports. And John Thompson, as the rare black man with real power in this world, was not immune to his flaws. Thompson grew up in segregated Washington 
and was fond of telling his players how, as a teenager growing up in D.C., he couldn't even hope to attend Georgetown because he was black. Thompson attended Providence College, then played for the Boston Celtics before beginning his coaching career. The McDonald's game in 1983 was the first of many encounters I would have with Thompson over the next 20 years. Thompson is an engaging and insightful commentator on race, but sprinkled with fascinating contradictions. He embraced his blackness, to the point that some accused him of using race as an anvil, and had nationalistic instincts. Thompson once allowed me to attend a practice session, then invited me on the court and introduced me to the team. He told me he wanted them to see a black role model, but years later, I joked that he wanted them to remember that I might be a brother, but I was also a reporter. At the same time, Thomas was an avowed capitalist whose agent, David Falk, was a white man to whom he steered most of his players. His team had played for the national championship in 1982, losing to North Carolina 63-62 to on a game-winning shot by Michael Jordan. The Hoyas had been eliminated from the NCAA tournament in the second round of the recently completed 1983 tournament. Critics felt that the successful recruitment of Reggie Williams would put Georgetown in the national championship hunt. They were right. With Reggie Williams in the lineup, Georgetown won the national championship in April 1984. With that victory, Georgetown made for itself a national reputation that would endure the ups and downs of the decades that followed and Thompson ensured himself lucrative employment for the rest of his career. The energy and investment put into that one recruit paid off in spades. One black teenager from Baltimore who could stick a jump shot made a multi-million dollar difference for one of the most prestigious universities in the nation and its coach. That's the logic that fuels the race for athletic talent. The sports industry is not just a signature aspect of the American way of life but has also become a major component of the American economy. What distinguishes sports from other industries is the nature of its raw material. For the past 50 years, the prime raw resource in the sports industry has been black muscle. The work of the industry is to extract those bodies from where they primarily reside, in the black neighborhoods of rural and urban America, and put them to work. Now, a sophisticated recruiting apparatus has been created for just that purpose, the apparatus is called the conveyor belt. With integration and the television-fueled growth of the sports industry, the value placed on black muscle dramatically escalated and the stakes in the recruiting game began to rise. Predominantly white colleges and universities, which once either banned or ignored black athletes, were now twisting themselves like pretzels to recruit them. Schools that had long disdained African-American athletes were now going out of their way to bring them on campus by any means necessary. The arms race was on. Bitter recruiting wars would be fought over young athletes, with all kinds of perks thrown in, from financial inducements to favors for family members and friends. The challenge for the black community over the past decades has been to figure out how to control this mad scramble for black athletic resources and harness its potential to achieve the community's social, economic, and political goals. But to do so would entail combating the delivery system I first witnessed at the All-America game in 1983 and would see in repeated variations during the next 20 years. It would require understanding and redirecting the conveyor belt. The recruiting process creates a fascinating reversal of fortune. The poor become rich, and those with the least access to higher education receive scholarships to some of the best institutions in America. Since 1936, when the Southeastern Conference became the first of the major collegiate conferences to award athletic grants and aid, the athletic scholarship has become the centerpiece of the college sports industry. But far from the large pool of potential athletes, only a handful make it to the finish line of an athletic scholarship or a big professional sports contract. The National Collegiate Athletic Association estimates that only 3% of high school seniors who played basketball in 2005 will continue to play in college and that only half of those 3% will receive some sort of athletic scholarship. But before the system winnows out the winners from the losers, there are literally hundreds of thousands of young athletes 
who will ride the conveyor belt at some point in their lives, even if most of us are not good enough to ride it to the end. The National Sporting Goods Association estimated that 866,000 children 12 years old and younger regularly play some form of organized baseball. 347,000 play football, 250,000 play basketball, and 36,000 play hockey. They play Little League Baseball, Pop Warner Football, Biddy Basketball, and Squirt Hockey. Traditionally, entry-level training in baseball, basketball, and football, usually starting around age 8, has been provided by national organizations like the YMCA and the YWCA, the Catholic Youth Organization, the Boys Club of America, and the Police Athletic League, and by municipal park and recreation departments. At that level, the teams are recreational outlets for the hundreds of thousands of youngsters who participate primarily for exercise, to learn physical confidence and discipline, and simply for the thrill of competition and the fun of emulating their professional heroes. For the more talented players, however, these programs function as tributaries that carry them to progressively more refined pools of talent. The conveyor belt runs through a sprawling network of feeder systems, youth leagues, camps, clubs, clinics, and scholastic leagues. The feeder systems separate large pools of participants, first by age, then by ability, helping to move young people from one level of competition to the next. The conveyor belt transports young athletes from innocent fun and games to clubs and specialized leagues, where they find increasingly rigorous competition and better training and coaching, and finally to colleges and pro leagues. The well-trained athletes paying fans watch every weekend represent the finished product. Most of the prestigious summer football and basketball camps are operated by white men who invite top high school players to work with and display their talent to invited coaches. At its best, the contemporary conveyor belt is a streamlined mechanism for developing players and offering training and showcases where talented players can display their talents for college scouts. At its worst, the conveyor belt introduces young people to the worst ills of the contemporary sports industrial complex while they're still young and impressionable. It's at the camps where many first learn about the gifted athlete's limitless entitlement. The better athletes learn that no wrong is too great to overlook, if not erase, that no jam is too severe to get out of. The conveyor process makes a future star feel he is above the fray from an early age. Isolated on the belt, young athletes become accustomed to hearing yes all the time and having adults fawn over them and give them second and third chances because of the promise of their talents. The end result is often as evident on the crime blotter as in the sports section. No matter how focused and disciplined they are on the court, young athletes are not given any restraints off the court. Life on the belt also often fosters dependency. Star athletes who are so inclined become accustomed to being shepherded through the system without ever having to look out for themselves. From simple perks like not having to stand in line to more serious crutches like being guided through school by tutors and structured study halls. Warren Brown, the former executive director of the National Federation of State High School Associations, objected to the showcase games for these very reasons. Not only were the games heavy-duty promotional jobs for the sponsoring companies using the unpaid talents of high school students, but we also think the games contribute to making sports bigger than life and making kids think that they're bigger than life because they are involved. For African-American athletes, the threat of the conveyor belt process goes beyond the ways in which it undermines character. The belt is also designed to dull any racial consciousness and eliminate communal instincts. Instead, the belt cultivates a culture of racial know-nothingism. Indeed, the act of processing athletes along the conveyor belt involves a significant and often subtle element of, quote, deprogramming potential troublemakers, black athletes who might be tempted to think of themselves or their situations in racial terms and who might want to use their prominence in the service of something other than enriching the institution. 
In a university, such troublemakers might include athletes who want to use their visibility to call attention to the need for more black head coaches or faculty on campus, or athletes interested in initiating or joining in causes that might embarrass the institution. On the conveyor belt, young athletes quickly learn that easy passage through a white control system is contingent upon not rocking the boat, not being a troublemaker, and making those in positions of power feel comfortable with the athlete's blackness. The trick for the masters of the belt, coaches, athletic departments, owners at the professional level, promoters and managers in sports like boxing, is to get control of young athletes early, take them away from any competitive interest, especially their own communities, and reward them with flashy goodies in order to keep them quiescent. Rudy Washington, the former head of the Black Coaches Association, once described the process. How tough is it to buy an inner city kid? Buy him some shoes, take him to dinner, get him some nice clothes, maybe a car. You become his best friend, and he gets hooked like a junkie. Washington said, then you control the product. The secret is controlling the product early. It's just like slavery. Modern day slavery is what it is. And you know the saddest part? The kids benefit from the system, at least a few lucky ones, with education and money, but what they often lose is any identification with the black community. Over time, the school-aged athlete's dislocation from the black community is manifest in the adult athlete's sense of alienation from his or her origins. In fact, among many athletes who have reached the professional level, their greatest fear is having to return to the community, to the point that some become afraid of the neighborhoods they grew up in. As Dennis Rodman has said, I go through the projects. That's not me anymore. No longer part of my life. Young athletes on the belt also get a twisted education in values, ethics, and character. As the competition for players intensifies, journalists have started to uncover the lengths to which big and small programs alike go to lure blue-chip black talent to their campuses. The first big expose I remember reading was when I was still a student athlete myself in college. It was a Sports Illustrated series by Jack Olson that documented the exploitation of black athletes, especially at the college level. The articles chronicled the crippling social isolation the athletes endured and various ways in which they were used and abandoned by the machinery of big-time sports. Because I attended a historically black school, where the kinds of abuses described by Olson were rare, I read the stories like dispatches from a foreign country. Black schools were far from perfect, but the wanton disregard for an individual's humanity was not something that took place at HBCUs. One egregious example of the dishonesty that pervades the recruiting process is the story of Tate's Locke, a former basketball coach at Clemson. Locke was so desperate to recruit black athletes to the school's South Carolina campus that he invented a phony black fraternity so black recruits would think there was actually a black student presence on campus. What were these students supposed to do once they signed on to Clemson? Who cared about their isolation then? The conveyor belt isn't always a story about race. Every sport has one, even those sports without significant black participation. Tennis, hockey, gymnastics. In sports like hockey, where a teenager can enter the minor leagues as early as junior year in high school, athletes begin rigorous competition as early as the fourth grade. By the eighth grade, many are seasoned veterans of travel. But race and the poverty that often goes hand in hand with black skin in this country adds a complicating factor to the belt. And of all the major team sports, Basketball offers the most poignant insights into the mechanics of the feeder system. Because of the growth of basketball during the past 15 years, it has been a vehicle for both hustlers and positive forces to exert their influence. The major difference with black athletes is the cultural dislocation and isolation the belt encourages, and the infantilizing effect this has on the athletes themselves and the wasted opportunity it represents for the communities they come from. In the black athlete's quest for power, the conveyor belt represents an especially serious impediment. 
Here are two stories that underline different dimensions of the conveyor belt. Chris Webber and Kellen Winslow represent two different lessons. Webber illustrates how one young man tried to control the belt but in some ways failed. Winslow illustrates how parents can maintain control of the raw material that travels on the belt. In the fall of 1991, Chris Webber, Juwan Howard, Jalen Rose, Jimmy King, and Ray Jackson momentarily turned the conveyor process on its ear. The five high school seniors decided they would go as a package to one university rather than blindly being transported down the belt and distributed without having any say in the matter. Five of the top players in the United States decided together that they would play for one college team in an effort to prove that talent, more than the coach, made the college game. These five freshmen would triple the fortunes of whichever university they chose. They could either put an unknown school on the map or take a known school to the Final Four. The significance of the so-called Fab Five was that five outstanding players understood their power. Five talented high school All-Americans gave players a glimpse of how they could empower themselves, make their own decisions, and find points of leverage that would shift the power balance from the masters of the belt to the athletes on it. Their story also illustrates the distinction between the rebel and the revolutionary. In their search, the Fab Five could have gone beyond the usual suspects and made an even more explosive statement. For instance, they could have chosen a historically black college and then taken it to the NCAA Final Four, as surely as they did Michigan, which would have shown a national spotlight on those schools, driven money and new blood into them, and provided an impressive model of black self-help. That would have been revolutionary. Instead, they staged a rebellion and chose Michigan, a decision that, in the grand scheme of things, still empowered the very system of power that has traditionally smothered black aspirations. They tried to control the belt, but in the end, they showed signs that the belt had already controlled them, limiting their thinking and ambition, and ensuring that they continued to serve the system. While the post-integration conveyor belt has handily fed white-run institutions, it has starved black ones. In 1992, the year Weber came out of high school, the best black college programs, based on NCAA tournament selection, were Southern and Alcorn. Davey Whitney was the head coach at Alcorn. Did they try to recruit Weber? Why weren't the HBCUs even in a position to try to land Weber? It goes back to the dilemma of integration. Black institutions were, by 1992, unable to compete. Weber criticized black colleges for not having built a better infrastructure, not having put themselves in a position of leverage during the time when they had a monopoly on black athletes to acquire the things that would make them more attractive to blue-chip black athletes. Better facilities, larger arenas, more up-to-date training facilities, and yes, television contracts. A lot of people put the pressure on me to go to an HBCU, like, come on, Chris. You can change it around. You can change it around. But I think that process has to start within the Black College Association. Playing on BET is not good enough for me, he said. Just like me playing on MTV is not good enough. I want the world to see. In a way, I feel guilty because we could have changed that rhyme. But in a way, we had to do what was best for us at the time. But we talked a lot about going to black colleges. In any event, Weber went to Michigan, and the Fab Five created serious wealth for that Big Ten school's athletic department. Michigan, with all five freshmen in the starting lineup, went to the Final Four their first year. The next year, as sophomores, the players made a second straight trip to the Final Four. They would lose both years in the championship game. The Fab Five was such a commercial hit for the university that years after those five players had moved on, the school was still selling Fab Five merchandise. Meanwhile, HBCUs continued their decline in competitiveness. A rich, predominantly white institution simply got richer from black labor while black institutions were left struggling. So, despite their inclination toward independence, 
Weber and his teammates' inability to truly oppose the power of the belt undermined their gesture of rebellion. Weber left school after his second year and was drafted by the Golden State Warriors of the NBA. But the mental training of the belt carried forward into his pro career. As noted, one of the negative effects of the conveyor belt is that it takes the athlete farther and farther away from their home communities, particularly if they were born in the segregated, pre-gentrified inner city. The more successful the athlete becomes, the farther the conveyor belt carries him from the first truth of his life. For someone like Weber, who was not a quote-unquote street kid to begin with, the guilt of escape can be overwhelming. And although the NBA is filled with black players of similar backgrounds, they've been unable to come together to form a supportive community within the league to replace the communities they've lost outside of the league. Such a community would have tremendous potential, bringing together young black men with money, visibility, and, whether they realize it or not, power. It has never coalesced. This is because the conveyor belt, with its breeding of a deep competitive spirit, does not engender camaraderie and kinship. For example, Weber said that fellow NBA star Kevin Garnett is one of his favorite players. But we don't get too close, because we still got the battle. So it's almost better to keep a distant relationship until our careers are over or until a special moment like the Olympics or All-Star break. And a lifetime of being manipulated by powerful and predominantly white coaches, boosters, administrators, team owners, and even the media leaves players fighting their own paranoia, which is another way in which potential unity is undermined. Guys don't respect each other. I might believe the stereotypes. Your wife is making all the decisions about the money anyway. Your agent is paying your bills. You ain't a man on your own anyway. You can't make the decision with me? Or... You got five cars. I don't want somebody with five cars in the business with me. What you need five cars for? There's so much of that mentality. I'm worried about mine or we've all made it now. So what are we worried about? And the belt breeds complacency, not militancy, with their eyes on the prize of individual success and pleasing the white hands that feed them. Players feel they can't risk a strategy of confrontation. Weber is aware of how this fear of the white power structure and the goodies it provides emasculates black athletes. People will be so worried about how they will be seen by history or how their commercials are going to be taken away. Now the thing is, don't step out of line. Now the cool thing is, I don't want to be looked at. Don't separate me. Don't pick on me. I even felt that way a couple of times too, and that's not good. We have so much influence, I don't think we know how much we have. This is what the belt teaches you, Weber added. That one thing, as black men, we can't say what's on our mind. You can never do that. I think you learn that on the conveyor belt. You learn you gotta shut up. You learn you got to be politically correct. You learn you got to say these cliches. It's the message on that conveyor belt since the 8th grade. Keep the trouble away from me. Ultimately, a child's movement into the world of sports shouldn't be about the athlete alone but about athletes and their parents and guardians. Ideally, the conscientious parent walks along the belt every step of the way, looking over the shoulder of all the operators who do the teaching, training, and coaching, making sure neither child nor handler loses focus. Sadly, in many cases, the parent or guardian is the one who loses focus. Janet Hill, whose son Grant was a star at Duke and in the NBA, estimates that only a handful of parents remain parents and not employees, just as subject to manipulation and control as the children they're supposed to be shepherding. Kellen Winslow, however, belongs to the first group. Kellen Winslow is a parent. Kellen Winslow was an all-time great NFL player, eventually inducted into the Hall of Fame. After leaving the NFL, he acquired a law degree. Winslow has a son, Kellen Jr., now a tight end for the Cleveland Browns. Winslow became a student of the belt in order to help his son navigate it successfully. The conveyor belt can take you a lot of places, do a lot of good things for you, but you have to be aware that you're on one, that people want something from you. You have something that they want. You better take advantage of that. What's damaging about the process is the lack of awareness by the person on the conveyor belt, he said. 
the lack of understanding that there is a system here and that from the time that you show any type of athletic prowess, I don't care if you were four years old, 14 years old, whatever, the moment you did something that made you different from the other kids, catch a ball, shoot a basket, the kid who's 12 years old and dunks the basketball, he's on the conveyor belt. And the lack of understanding by the student athlete on the conveyor belt or by the parent that this is taking place puts you at a disadvantage. At the beginning of the 2000 season, Kellen Winslow Jr. announced on national television that he would attend the University of Miami. The Hurricanes were a compromised choice. Kellen Jr. had originally wanted to attend the University of Washington. His father had said, hell no. Winslow used his experience, his knowledge of the business, his understanding of how these things work to help his son make an informed decision. And when he came back with the wrong decision, I told him no. That's what I'm supposed to do. At times it was not pretty, the elder Winslow admitted. Here he is. He's a man. Everybody loves him. Everybody wants him. Everybody wants a piece of him. Everything's good. He had to give his son a recruiting pitch of his own. Remember, Kel, the father said, these people have known you for 45 days. I've known you all your life. When they're finished with you, I'm still going to be here. I don't want you to fail. I want you to succeed. So why in the world do you think I'm keeping you from doing something that you want to do and you're not understanding that I know this is the wrong thing? Winslow told his son he was prepared to go to the mat. I told him, I'm going to fight you on this one. The night before we went on a sports talk show at Fox, I told him, if you get on that TV and you tell them you're going to Washington, I'm going to tell you no on national television. You don't believe me? Try me. He said, I believe you. I said, you damn right. Winslow did not like the way Washington had recruited his son. Winslow and Rick Neuheisel. Footnote. Neuheisel was fired in June 2003 for participating in neighborhood gambling pools on the previous two NCAA men's basketball tournaments. He sued the university and the NCAA and settled out of court in 2005. End of footnote. The Washington head coach had been teammates at San Diego, but when Washington recruited his son, they went through the coaches at school. Rarely did they contact Winslow. When an appointment was made to make a home visit, it was made with Kellen and not with me. The meeting was supposed to be on Tuesday. Rick was coming into town. On Monday, I just got back in from a trip, and Tuesday, Kellen tells me that Washington is coming in. I said, says who? He said, Coach Neuheisel is going to be here. I said, but nobody called me, so we canceled the visit. Neuheisel can pick up the phone and call me. Michigan State did it. Ohio State did it. This was both a fit of peak and a reasonable response. One of the common tactics of the conveyor belt is to drive a wedge between the athlete and any adult who can't be bought off, even the parent. College recruiting coaches know how to manipulate kids, cajole high school coaches, and seduce some parents. When they have to deal with a competing authority figure who won't be co-opted, they get frustrated and redouble their efforts to get a direct line to the kid. Winslow saw what was going on. When I know you and you can't call me, that's a problem. This is my child. This is my greatest resource right here. This is his future. And if I get a feeling that things are not going to be right in the recruiting process, how are they going to be when he gets to campus? These are details, and I preach to him details. You don't make an appointment to go to the parents' house without talking to the parents. My name is on that mortgage. School sent out scholarship papers. USC, Ohio State, Michigan State. They all called before they sent the papers. Washington did not. These are legally binding documents. Suppose Kellen wants to go to Washington so bad, he's going to deny his father and he forges my name. Then we have a mess. We sent the papers back, overnight mail. Then, instead of calling me, they called Kellen at school. Red flag, number three or four. There was a basketball coach, a swimming coach at Kellen's high school who was a Washington alum who Rick knew. They're talking to them. I said, no, 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 he has a father. You might go into a lot of homes where there's not a father, but this child has a father. You might not like it, 
but you got to deal with it. Winslow also wanted his son to at least consider a black coach or school. He called Bobby Williams, the former Michigan State head coach. Footnote, Williams was dismissed in 2002. End of footnote. Because he wanted his son to meet a black Division I head football coach and a black athletic director. It's not about football, Winslow said. Football is just a means to an end. If he tells me he wants to go to Grambling or Howard, historically black colleges, I'm driving him because if he has the ability to play on the next level, they're going to find him. In the end, Kellen Jr. went to Miami. The Hurricanes won the national championship in his freshman year. In the Rose Bowl game, he recovered a fumble. Kellen Winslow Sr. was born in East St. Louis, Illinois on November 5, 1957. His experience on the belt was different from his son's because he didn't climb on until his senior year in high school. This variation in experience is what gave him insight into dealing with the predominantly white sports industrial complex. In the 8th grade, he told his mother he was going to go to college on an athletic scholarship. She said fine, but that it would help if he played a sport. Instead of playing sports, Winslow had held down a job from the time he was a sophomore in high school at UPS, where he lied about his age to get the job. But in his senior year, Winslow took a leave of absence from UPS to go out for the football team. He went on to play at the University of Missouri and was a first-round draft choice of the San Diego Chargers, playing for them from 1979 to 1987. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1995. His son played many sports growing up, baseball, flag football, soccer, but his father held off on letting him play tackle football until he turned 14. When he turned 14, I wish I would have said 15, Winslow said. When he was a kid, you could tell he had a great deal of promise and that people were going to be after him. You could tell when he was six years old that was going to happen. But I was holding him back so he wouldn't get exposed to negative influences and bad coaching. Unlike his dad, Kellen Jr. went to all the football camps during his summers in high school. Tennessee, Georgia, Stanford. So the whole collegiate world knew about him before he became a senior in high school, Winslow said. Although Winslow's own parents had met all the coaches, no one in his family was familiar with the conveyor belt, much less how it operated. His father had never been an athlete growing up because his mother would not let him play sports. Instead, he was in the band. Neither parent had gone to college. So this was a totally new experience for my immediate family. I had two cousins who had grown up with me who had gone off to college and they were both girls. So at the time, who was going to give you insights? His coaches were good, but you really rely on your parents at that time for insight. And there was very little, Winslow said. They didn't know about this industry and they told me that. At the time, you take everything a recruiter says as the gospel. But when Kellen came along and recruited started to show up, I already knew the gospel. I had lived it, preached it. Kellen Sr.'s parents were like so many parents, black and white, but especially black, just grateful that their son was going to college. And I was the first one. They certainly did not see him as the raw material of an industry. Some of the questions that I asked when recruiters came in asking about Kellen Jr. never crossed my mind when I was being recruited, and I'm sure they didn't cross my parents' mind because they had no point of reference, no basis to ask those kind of questions. When they came in to recruit my son, I treated him just like that. You want something from him? He can do something for you. That's the only reason you're coming through this door. We have to get parents to understand that. You earn a scholarship, you're not given a scholarship. You have to change the language that people use. Once you change their language, you change their perspective. Once an athlete begins to see him or herself as the raw material of an industry, the attitude begins to change. You begin to understand that nothing is made without you. It's a matter of trying to get those natural resources, all with different interests, different positions to get them under one roof and to get them to understand, getting the masses to understand that they do have strength, they do have ability. This is a crucial problem with black athletes, the notion that they should be grateful for the things that they've rightfully earned, 
that they should come hat in hand in gratitude for the money and power that they themselves generate. It's this sense of gratitude and subservience, even under the bravado of many athletes' boastfulness and preening, that in the end undermines any effort to take control of the conveyor belt and the raw resources it transports, and it's the belt that reinforces this idea. Kellen Winslow Sr., who rode on a less well-developed belt than the one that kids today face, was able to see through this deception. Even so, he didn't stop being grateful until the end of his sophomore year at Missouri. The only reason his eyes were opened was that his mentors, African-American educators at the university, took Winslow under their wing. He knows how rare this is today. How many players at football and basketball factories have African-American role models? How many have role models who will help them open their eyes? Dr. Walter Daniel, the vice chancellor of the University of Missouri system when Winslow was a student, was also an English professor at the school. He adopted Winslow as his son during Winslow's college career. Winslow haunted Daniel's home and office, soaking up guidance. He asked me a lot of questions. He made me think about things, about me being there at Missouri, what it meant to be there. What would I be doing if I wasn't there? He helped me understand the advantage of being in college and that there was something going on around me I wasn't aware of. There was a whole system involved and I was just sort of going through the motions and not aware. Having a mentor outside the system prevented the belt from doing its normal work of numbing the senses and anesthetizing Winslow to the possibilities that exist outside the athletic world. In Winslow's case, this meant staying academically eligible. He nearly flunked out the first semester of his sophomore year. I was very immature. I had a coach who was a screamer and a yeller, and I wasn't used to that. I took that very personal. I was set to leave, go home. Once my eyes opened up, I said, Okay, okay. I need to do this. I can do that. This is a possibility. But I've got to be here to be a part of it. In 1956, Prentice got became the first African-American to receive a football scholarship to the University of Oklahoma. Footnote, Dr. Gort passed away in 2005. End of footnote. Gort was an invaluable mentor to Winslow because he had lived through the segregated sports history and had broken a barrier. At a time when the Big Eight Conference had increasing numbers of black players, Gort was a living witness to testify that life wasn't always this grand for black athletes. He told Winslow stories about how, as a boy growing up in Norman, Oklahoma, he and his friends used to sneak into the University of Oklahoma Stadium and run for imaginary touchdowns, thinking this was the closest they'd ever get to playing for the Sooners. Then, the summer after his senior year at Douglas High School, Gort received a last-minute invitation to participate in the Oklahoma State North-South High School All-Star Game, previously open only to whites. North had suffered some key injuries to its running backs, and the coach then extended the invitation. Gort accepted, and wound up being named the game's most valuable player. After the game, a scout from Oklahoma came by and said that Bud Wilkinson, the legendary Oklahoma coach, wanted Gort to come to Oklahoma. There was no scholarship offer. Gort would be a walk-on. He told Winslow how a group of black doctors and pharmacists who knew his family and wanted Gort to integrate the Oklahoma athletic program raised $4,000, four years tuition, and presented it to his family. At mid-season of Gort's first year, Wilkinson quietly put Gort on full athletic scholarship and returned the $4,000. In his sophomore year, Gort became the first black to play in a varsity game for Oklahoma. Gort enjoyed a brilliant career at Oklahoma and played eight seasons in the National Football League, seven with the St. Louis Cardinals. He became an assistant coach at Missouri and earned his Ph.D. in educational psychology from Missouri in 1975. In 1994, Gort became the senior associate commissioner of the Big Eight, now the Big 12 Conference. Winslow was deeply influenced by Gort. He understood the system and he took advantage of it. To be the first player of color at the University of Oklahoma, to get his master's degree, to get his PhD, to go out and work at the Big 8 office. 
there were other black men who exercised that same sort of influence over Kellen. The only reason I played high school football is that my high school coach, an African-American man, saw something in me that I did not see in myself. Of course, there were non-blacks who were also influential to Winslow, but Prentice and Dr. Daniel were special because they looked like me. They had been down that road. The only reason I went to law school was because of Dr. Daniel. He planted that thought in my mind so many years ago. But even during those earlier, seemingly more innocent days, the effects of the belt's mental control were starting to manifest themselves. Winslow calls his generation of African-American athletes, those who entered college in 1975, the generation that stopped talking about race. I am probably the second generation after integration. We stopped talking about it. Race. As a collective, our generation stopped talking about it and that put us behind. You had to do certain things. You played a certain role to be a part of the system and to survive. The athletes and the black coaches had to talk one way around each other, one way around fellow coaches and players or the white alums and white big donors. Having witnessed both the negative possibilities of the belt and a way to manage it, Winslow was ready by the time his son's time came. Like other athletes who became parents to athletes, he was wiser and had a deep reservoir of experience to draw from, like the parents of Mike Bibby, Kobe Bryant, or Grant Hill. I was just doing what was best for him. I was just being his father. And people can say I had a social agenda because I did those things. That's their opinion. If I don't bring up these subjects, knowing what I know, then I don't deserve to be his father. He also had to look at Kellen the way recruiters were looking at him as a coveted resource. I tried to get him to understand that he had a position of strength now because once he gets on campus, it changes. Winslow is unfortunately the exception to the rule. The belt usually carries young black athletes out of black America and introduces them to a world with very few African Americans, a world of white agents, real estate brokers, bank presidents, trustees, and lawyers. The fact that so many of the athletes' closest advisors are not African American means that they are never around black models of leadership, a situation that undermines their own ability to become leaders, rather than pampered passive followers. When his son was a high school senior, Winslow already had his process set up. His son would attend a school where there was either a black head football coach or a significant African American presence on the team. Winslow was attacked for his position, even his son resisted. At first, he didn't get it, Winslow said of his son, but as time went on, after he had signed with Miami, he got a chance to step back and take a look at it, and got a chance to go down and spend time at the University of Miami, and understand what it meant to be there. And then, later on, from some of his experiences, he began to understand what I was trying to get across to him. For Winslow, the key to overthrowing the belt is to get back to history. The difficulty is getting players to understand where they came from. It wasn't that long ago that Shaq couldn't have played at LSU because of segregation. It really wasn't that long ago, he said. You want to talk about time and understanding. But when I came out of high school and I began to read and I began to get exposed to things, I got angry. They grow up, and then one day they're 15, 18, they're 21, they realize they're black. They wake up and realize that they are black men in America, and then they begin to understand what that means, because they're no longer an athlete. I'll be the first to tell you that people treat African American athletes differently than they treat African American men. They have to understand where they came from. Most of them don't. The ultimate effect of the conveyor belt is not so much to deliver young black athletes to the pros, but to deliver them with the correct mentality. They learn not to rock the boat, to get along. They learn by inference about the benevolent superiority of the white man and enter into a tacit agreement to let the system operate without comment. By the time they reach the NBA, the NFL, or Major League Baseball, 
black athletes have put themselves on an intellectual self-check. You don't even have to guard them. They'll miss the shot. The black athlete learns early on that the best way to continue the trip on the conveyor belt is to accept the power structure as it is. The young, talented athlete learns about the value of cultivating the far-reaching range of affiliations, connections, and alliances that can make the athlete's conveyor belt journey smooth. He also learns about the kinds of associations and ideas that can make it quite miserable or even terminate it altogether. Thus, even the athlete who believes in, quote, black power, is given pause when confronted by a white-controlled power structure. Owners, CEOs of merchandising operations, media executives, and so on, that can make big things happen in the player's career. One positive sign is that a new generation of younger black athletes are not brain-locked into the black labor, white wealth arrangement that has been so prevalent for so long. Many have started to use an expanded network of black professionals to negotiate contracts and represent them in a variety of business ventures. Black agents are emerging, slowly but surely, many of them young and possessed of the aggression of the hip-hop generation. This is progress of a sort, but it is not the promised land. In some cases, it's merely black exploitation replacing white exploitation. To really honor the struggles of the past, however, the ultimate goal must be to create a new and better model, not to replace an old form of oppression with a new one.